This is where we are, but not where we will stay. These are our Sundays, our Wednesdays, our everydays. This is our passion, our heartbeat, our song. We don't have any members because we are family. Whether for the first time or the hundredth time, for the good times and even the bad, this place has been good. But now we go to better. We go to a sanctuary, a place of rest and refuge, a place we can call home, a home for our God, a home for us all. Let's go together. journey has begun. Come with us. Kingdom Cathedral, a new home for New Life Covenant Church. Hey guys, Bishop here, and I'm coming to you from Harare. You know, we have our Sunday morning services that most of you uh, watch live, and it's in so many different time zones. For some it's really sacrificial, some go to the channel and pick it up later but thank you so much for your kind comments uh, thank you so much for your support thank you so much for your encouragement it gives teach and I hope and our team at New Life Covenant Church that we're doing things right but again thank you for your support and for those of you that are giving to Kingdom Cathedral we are so grateful you know only eternity will tell the gratitude that we have for your support we love you guys very much and continue to follow us and we do appreciate your comments because it helps us get better, it helps us improve our product, and it helps us as a church. Thank you so much, guys. God bless you. Hallelujah! I don't know about you, but for me, there's so much to be grateful for. Especially this year, I'm so grateful to the Lord. Hallelujah!
today, even in the midst of everything that's going on around the globe, give the Lord praise. Oh, ah. He has made us triumphant. Yeah. Hallelujah. You have won the victory. Second Corinthians chapter number 10. Second Corinthians chapter number 10, starting from verse 13. 
but we will not boast of things outside our measure, but according to the measure of the rule which God has distributed to us, a measure to reach even to you. For we stretch not ourselves beyond our measure as though we had reached not to you, for we are come as far as to you, also in, preaching, in the preaching of the gospel of Christ. Not boasting of the things outside of our measure, that is, of other men's labors, but having hope when your faith is increased, that we shall be enlarged, enlarged. We shall be enlarged. When your faith is increased, we shall be enlarged by you according to our, abundant, our rule abundantly. And that is to preach the gospel in the regions beyond you and not to boast of another man's uh, or another man's line of things made ready to our hand. I'm now in the book of Acts chapter number nine. We'll pull out a couple of verses there starting from verse one. Acts chapter number nine. And Saul, who later on becomes the apostle Paul, uh, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus to the synagogues. And um, that he found, if he found in his way any believers, whether they were men or women, that they might be arrested and be bound to Jerusalem. And as he journeyed and came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth, and he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the thorns and not be pricked. And he trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what will you have me do? And the Lord said, Arise, go to the city of Damascus, and when you get there, you will be told you what you must do. And he was three days without sight, and also three days fasting, not eating or drinking. And a certain disciple in Damascus named Ananias, to whom the Lord had said in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Lord, I'm here. And the Lord said to him, Arise, go into the street, which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas, who is for one who is called Saul of Tarsus. For, for behold, he is praying. Everyone say, he is praying. Say, he is praying. And uh, has seen a vision of a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hands on him that he might receive his sight. And Ananias answered the Lord and said, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. And uh, he is here and has authority from the chief priests to bind all that call on your name. And the Lord said to him, go your way, for he is a chosen vessel to me. For he is a chosen vessel to me. To bear my name before the Gentiles, to bear my name before kings, and to bear my name uh, to the children of Israel. Verse 16, for I will show him great things. He must suffer for my name's sake. Father, we thank you for your blessing and your grace and your anointing in this service. Uh, turn with me to Acts chapter number 28 and verse 28. The book of Acts is the second book that the apostle Luke wrote. And this is the last part of the book of Acts. Verse 28. Be it known therefore to you that the salvation of God is sent to the Gentiles and that they hear it. So when he says, be it known therefore to you, he's talking to Theophilus. Because chapter number one, verse one, he says to Theophilus, O great Theophilus, this is the second treatise that I'm bringing to you. So he says, be it known to you, Theophilus, that this, the message of salvation is also to the Gentiles. And uh, when he had said these words, the Jews departed 
and had great reasoning among themselves. Verse number 30. And Paul dwelt two whole years in his own hired house and received all that came into him. Number one, preaching the kingdom of God. Please say that. And number two, teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no man forbidding him. The message this half this morning is entitled Measuring the Kingdom, and this is part three. Measuring the Kingdom, and this is part three in a series we, we've been putting together. The beginning of the year, I started with the theme Entering the Kingdom, and I've built several mini uh, uh, slots of entering the kingdom. And uh, in terms of measuring the kingdom, part three, today we're dealing with apostolic measure, apostolic rank, uh, the measure of gifting given to individuals. The Bible says in chapter number 28 and verse 31 of Acts that Paul was called to teach Christ but he was also called to preach the kingdom because the kingdom has to be preached. Uh, John the Baptist came announcing the kingdom. Jesus came preaching and acting and releasing the kingdom. And then in Acts chapter number 1, verse 1 through to verse 8, when he instructed his apostles, the Bible says he taught them many infallible truths concerning the kingdom. And this is after his resurrection for 40 days and nights, appeared to his disciples and taught them many infallible things concerning the kingdom. The lessons that he taught in those 40 days were lessons that uh, were enhanced of the things he had already taught them. And you'll find this throughout the three major gospels uh, where the Lord is teaching very heavily concerning the kingdom of God. What Jesus came to do, he came to restore that which was lost, which was God's image in the earth, God's likeness in an environment of the kingdom of God. And so the Apostle Paul's journey as a believer and his journey as an apostle begins on the Damascus Road. And it is here that his assignment is specified. Initially, his assignment is not given to him his assignment is given to Ananias, who the scripture describes as a disciple or the apostolic leader in the city of Damascus. And Ananias is told by the Lord, he said, I need you to go and pray for this man. Uh, he is in the house of uh, a certain individual. And... Um, I have great things in store for him. The individual, his name is uh, Judas. And uh, there's one in his house called Saul of Tarsus. And he says to Ananias uh, in verse 15, he says, he's a chosen vessel unto me and he will bear my name to the Gentiles. He will appear before kings and he will also teach the children of Israel. And so, <clears throat> excuse me, when Ananias receives this mandate from God to pray for uh, Saul, who becomes Paul, he's filled with a lot of trepidation. And uh, he was skeptical because uh, it, it was kind of like rumored amongst the uh, circle of believers or Christians uh, that his strategy, Saul's strategy, was to announce he was a Christian and uh, people would come out from their hiding place to embrace him and then they would be arrested. And so God then, or the Lord then, appears to Ananias and speaks very firmly to him and specifies that Paul has a ministry. And it's interesting that uh, the scripture says that he is a chosen vessel unto me. Because there are, many, there are many that are called, but there are few that are chosen. And so he doesn't say he's called. He said he's chosen. And, and there's a difference between being called and a difference between being chosen. For many are called and 
Few are chosen. And if you put Paul alongside all the apostles that Jesus had called, Paul was not just called, but he was chosen. And when you begin to differentiate between being called and chosen, there are certain things that God will only trust to chosen vessels. There are some things that God doesn't show people that are called, but there are some things that God will entrust to individuals that are chosen. We are all equal, but we're not equal, because there are some that cannot carry some of the things that God has in store for the people of God. And so number one, he's a chosen vessel. Number two, he's going to represent the gospel to the Gentiles. Paul talks about this in the book of Galatians. He will appear before kings, not all the apostles that Jesus had called had the privilege of appearing and speaking to kings. And number three, he will represent me to the lost sheep of the children of Israel. And so the apostles in their respective ministries uh, were given a calling. Let's go to Matthew chapter number 10 and verse uh, number 1 to 7. I'll paraphrase, paraphrase the first six verses, but then we'll read verse number seven. These are the names of the apostles that Jesus had called, and their names are listed, and it is in this chapter that they are paired two by two. Scripture says, what God has joined together, let not man put asunder, Matthew 19. And in that chapter, he's referring to marriage, but he's also now referring to a universal law of what God joins together. And it's in this particular chapter that Peter and John are joined together. And uh, let's go to verse 7. And he says to them, As you go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand, or the kingdom of heaven has landed. And so I'm telling you what to preach. I'm telling you what to say. And I'm telling you how you must say it. And he instructs them, Don't take your wallet or your purse don't take a bag of money. Don't take a uh, weapon to defend yourself because the, the kingdom, as it is preached, built into it, are the tools that will make provision for your needs and also are the instruments that will be there to defend you. And so Peter and John are joined together and you'll see them in several features. For example, in the book of Acts chapter number three, Peter and John were going to the temple to pray at the hour of prayer. Uh, in Acts chapter number 8, uh, Philip had fled to the city of Samaria, and there were many outstanding miracles that they performed. Uh, the sick were healed, the lame were walking, the paralyzed uh, received healing, only that the Holy Spirit was not poured out, even though they were baptized in the name of the Lord. And so round about chapter number 8, verse 16 and 17, Peter and John came to the city of Samaria, and when they laid hands on the disciples, they began to speak with other tongues. Galatians chapter number 2, verse 7. But contrarywise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me, that's the Gentiles, as the gospel of the circumcision was uh, given unto Peter, for he that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, that's the Jews, the same was mighty in me toward the Gentiles. So Peter and John, their assignment was to preach the gospel to the Jews. And they were used mightily uh, in, in breaking down the gospel to the Jews. And then the gospel to the Gentiles was given uh, custodianship to that of the Apostle Paul. And Paul was used mightily in many, many signs and wonders to reach the Gentiles. Let's go to Acts chapter number 20 and let's read verse 4. Acts 20 verse 4. Uh, well, let, let me jump into chapter 13, starting from verse 1, paraphrased again. The Bible says the church in Antioch was mightily uh, endowed with grace and with power. And in that church, they served the Lord with fasting and prayer as they ministered to the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit gave a specific mandate for Paul or Saul and Barnabas to be separated for a special uh, work to reach the Gentiles. And so they went out preaching in places like Cilicia 
and many, many other places. And uh, Paul and Barnabas were joined together in ministry. Uh, then in Acts chapter number 14, the apostle Paul is stoned in a place called Lystra, but he goes back into the city and preaches the gospel. Paul and Barnabas were kind of like divided in chapter number 15 of the book of Acts over a dispute because Paul refused to take John Mark, who is the apostle that wrote the gospel of Mark. And Paul's uh, specific point was, you know, we, we're going into very difficult territory and this young man is immature. And Barnabas said, in essence, we've got to give him a chance. And the Bible says that their dispute was so violent and so eruptuous that they separated their, their ways and Paul then began to travel with Silas. Uh, and so Paul then realizes that going into certain areas to preach the gospel, he needed to assemble groups or teams. And so a, a, a tremendous team is assembled when they go into Asia. That brings us now into Acts chapter 20 and verse 4. Acts chapter 20, verse 4. And they accompanied Paul into Asia, number one, Sopater of Berea and of the Thessalonians, Aristarchus and Secundus and Gaius of Derbe and Timotheus. And of uh, Asia, there was Tychicus and Trophimus. These going before waited for us at Troas. Notice, waited for us, not waited for him. So, the writer of the book of Acts, Luke, was part of Paul's team, waited for us. And so the Apostle Paul going into uh, break into Asia, which he had tried earlier in Acts chapter number 14 uh, and, and was stoned, recognized that the demonic forces they were dealing with in chapter number 14 of the book of Acts were very powerful and very strong and that it was going to take a team effort of men that had a measure of rule to deal with the austerity and the uh, brutality of demonic princes. And so it takes him now, Acts 14, 15, 16, and in chapter number 16, when he goes to Philippi, you see how Paul is, is uh, arrested, he's whipped, and he's in a Philippian jail. And uh, Acts 16, 24, 25 and 26, Paul and Silas were singing praise at midnight, how the jail rocks because of an earthquake, and how the church in Philippi started. Acts chapter 17, he goes to Athens. He speaks with enticing words of men's wisdom and can't start a great church there. In Acts chapter number 18, uh, he goes and starts the church in Corinth, and the Lord tells him, stay in this city because I have many, many souls here. He stays for two years. Acts 19, we have the, the great move of God in, uh, uh, in, in Ephesus where Paul is joined by the 12 disciples of John, Philip, uh, uh, Priscilla, and Aquila are, are part of that team. And how in Acts chapter number 19, verse 6 and 7, uh, the apostles of John receive the Holy Ghost, they are rebaptized, and the uh, central team to start the church in Ephesus is key. Now, after they leave Ephesus, Paul needs to go into Asia to preach the gospel. But he doesn't go into Asia with a group of men that are just ordinary. He goes into Asia with a group of men that have a significant measure of rule. Everyone say measure of rule. Measure. Say that again. Say measure of rule. Measure. For apostolic uh, grace to reach certain areas, uh, even within our continent. There has to be individuals that have a measure of rule. And again, you know, I, I come into this point where uh, we have individuals, including some in New Life Covenant Church, that are on social media lines disputing things like uh, there's no such thing as rank, there's no such thing as somebody being higher than the other, and of course, obviously, individuals don't understand how the scripture is structured and read because there are certain things that God entrusts to individuals. 
or start with an Old Testament setting and come to a new. In the Old Testament, uh, chapter number 12 of the book of Numbers, for example, uh, the first family, Aaron, uh, Miriam, Aaron, and Moses had some sort of a dispute over Moses' wife. The Bible says that uh, they disputed Moses over his marriage to an Ethiopian woman. And so it's apparent from research that Miriam was fair-skinned and Aaron was fair-skinned. The Bible calls them fair. And so when uh, Moses' wife arrives, the Bible says she was Ethiopian. And the word Ethiopian there means burnt face. And so, you know, this whole Black Lives Matter issue and so on and so forth, this is not new. This goes back to way back in Old Testament settings because of the racial uh, preference of the first family leading Israel, they weren't happy that Moses was marrying a black woman. And so uh, you can have family disputes over domestic issues such as that, but where they crossed the line, they challenged Moses' leadership. They challenged his rank and challenged his anointing. And in essence, they said, you know, you're not the only one that God speaks to. And so then God then begins to draw a, and delineate in that teaching uh, why Moses was different to them. And he says, I speak to my prophets in visions and in dreams, but I speak to Moses face to face. And so he establishes here that, that there are ranks among the apostles that Moses is a face-to-face -face prophet. Yes, Miriam, you are a prophet, Exodus 15, 25, and Aaron, you are a prophet, Exodus chapter number 7, and you have your place in the prophetic line. And in Acts chapter number 11, Moses had appointed and selected 70 men on whom the Spirit of God was taken and put all of, on all of them, and they all prophesied, but none of them had the same rank or authority and uh, um, relationship with God as Moses did. And so Joshua is called Moses' minister. And in chapter number 38, chapter number 34, verse 9 of Exodus, uh, the Lord instructed Joshua, Moses to separate Joshua and laid his hands on Joshua. Now there were individuals that were selected to go and spy the land, chapter number 13 of Numbers, 12 men, princes of the nation of Israel, each one representing a tribe. These were the highest rank in each specific tribe. Ten came back with an evil report. Two came back with a good report. And so not all Israelites were the same in rank. Not all were the same in, in authority. Those that were chosen had a measure of rule that was selected above. So much so that in chap at chapter number 14 of the book of Numbers, the 10 spies that gave an evil report caused Israel to go into 40 years of horrible uh, wilderness uh, tragedy of death uh, and, and all those 21 years and above were forbidden by God to enter into the promised land. The Bible says their carcasses were scattered throughout the wilderness for 40 years. And so when you have individuals that are called by God and given a measure of rule, their message, their posture, their faith determines whether you enter into a thing or not. And so I really don't have time to debate over foolishness and folly based on my own experience. A lot of times you have people debating on issues when they themselves had, have not had an experience. And you can't argue with somebody that has walked in something and had the experience uh, and, and has produced certain things in their life and in their ministry. I would be, I, it would be ludicrous for a person like me that has achieved so much in ministry to put Ezekiel Guti in the same place as you, Tanashe. It's ridiculous. If you look at what Archbishop Guti has done by his hands and his ministry, you can't compare him to a deacon. And you can't compare a deacon to an elder. And there are elders that have greater honor on their lives than another elder. And one of our greatest elders in this church is sitting right here in the front, the chairman of our board, 
uh, Dr. Pastor Indiraya, but you can't put Indiraya in the same room with Ezekiel Guti and say they are the same rank. They don't have the same rank. If, if people in Acts chapter number 8, if individuals like the centurion can say to Jesus, just point and send the word and my servant shall be healed, and Jesus marvels because the man says, I am a man under authority. And if Gentiles who are not believers understand authority, how much more us as believers? So stop the stupidity of having these ridiculous discussions on, on uh, WhatsApp platforms on rank. There's no such thing as rank. Paul, I know. Jesus, I know. But who are you? And so there is a measure of rule. Everyone say measure of rule. So let's go back and look at 2 Corinthians chapter number 10 again and break this down to exegete the passage and then add to the achievements of what the Apostle Paul had achieved to embellish the exegesis of the text. But we will not boast of things without our measure. So Paul had a measure. If you go to chapter number 13 of the book of Matthew, the scripture there says there was a woman that took three measures of flour and measured them into three different areas. Those measures were the courtyard, the holy place, the holiest of holies. If you read the book of uh, uh, Numbers when, oh, and Leviticus where they had to make the anointing oil, there were certain measures used Calamus, cinnamon, uh, frankincense, and so on. They had to be certain weights, 500 grams, 500, 500, 250. And he said, nobody must violate the measures I have given because each component of the anointing oil had to have its own expression. And he said, cursed is the man who violates the measurement. So there are things that God measures that must be adhered to. If you don't like it, in Dabazako. And so he says, yeah, I will not boast of things outside of my measure. He's saying, I know my measure, but according to the measure of rule which God has distributed to us. And my measure has reached even to you. He's talking to the Corinthians. And if you want a direct reference to what he's saying, you must go and look at Acts chapter number 18 and read how Paul goes to Athens, uh, goes from Athens in chapter 17 to the Corinthians in chapter number 18. And in studying the passage, you discover in Acts chapter number 18 how the apostle Paul uh, was going to leave Corinth and move on. And the Lord spoke to him and said, you must remain in Corinth for I have much people in the city. And Paul stays in Corinth for two whole years, longer than any place he had been before. And it is in the book in, in Corinth that, that Paul begins to teach certain things. My belief, and scholars uh, attest to this, that it was in Corinth where Paul began to discover many infallible truths that will affect and shape the church both then and now. For example, 1 Corinthians chapter number 12, verse 1. I would not have you ignorant, brethren, concerning spiritual gifts. And in chapter 12, verse 1, all the way down to verse 13, Paul begins to expound very clearly the function of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. There are nine of them. If Paul had not spent time in Corinth, it's possible he would not have discovered and would not have been able to literally place the function and the gifts of the Holy Spirit and the order in which they function. Nine gifts of the Holy Spirit, another time, another message. Also in 1 Corinthians chapter number 12, Paul begins to then speak about the body of Christ, that we are all members of one body. He says, if one say I am the eye, where with the earring? If one says, I am the ear, where with the smelling? And the hand cannot say to the foot, I have no need of thee. So it is in this place that Paul begins to 
systematically teach the function of the body of Christ. That each member of the body is significant. That we are reliant on each member. Now, in the human body, uh, there are certain functions in the human body that we can do without. I have seen individuals that have been through horrendous tragedies and maybe a, an accident where they've had to have their legs amputated. Right here. I've, I saw a man who had all up to his thigh amputated. But the fact that he had no legs didn't mean that he, he was dying. Because you can live with no legs. You can live with no arms. And there are some members in the body that are more important than the other. And there are members in the body that you cannot live without. And so the Apostle Paul says, even in the body of Christ, there are members that have higher rank than others. And then in chapter number 13, the, the immaculate chapter on, on how everything is tied by love. Chapter number 14 of Acts of uh, 1 Corinthians, uh, Paul says, uh, everything must be generated out of the spirit of love. He said, if I prophesy and if I have revelations that bend a person's mind and I do all of that without love, it's absolutely nothing because everything that is done must be done in love. He said, if I speak in tongues of men and of angels and I have not love, it is nothing. I am a prating fool. And then he says also in 1 Corinthians chapter number 14, he says, uh, when you speak in tongues and when you prophesy, there is an order in which it is done. Because if you all begin to speak in tongues at the same time in a service and one comes off the street, they'll say you are mad. But if you have somebody that prophesies, they will know that the presence of God is there. And so, for example, while I'm preaching, if people start breaking out in tongues here, he's saying it's out of order. He says, let everything be done decently and in order. But when I'm finished with this service and we pray, we're going to encourage every person that has been baptized in the Holy Ghost to speak with other tongues. And when we are all speaking in tongues together, it's, it's different tongues, but in the order of a prayer meeting that has been authorized and designated in that time and space. Are we together? Oh, this is a very apostolic message. And so Paul says, my measure has reached even unto you. So let's look at the churches that are mentioned in the book of Acts and in various places that Paul started. I've listed 32 here. There's Seleucia, Cyprus, Salamis, Pamphius, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea, Colossae, Hierap Hierapolis, uh, Lyconium, Iconium, Lystra, Derby, cities of uh, Laconia, cities of Poseidon, Pamphylia, Pergia, Atelia, Colossae, Thessalonica, Corinth, Galatia, Philippi, Macedonia, Achaia. Acts chapter number 50, um, 1 Corinthians, Romans, come on to you, Romans chapter number 15. Paul said, I will come to you in Rome when I'm on my way to Spain. So he talks about going to Spain in uh, Romans 15, 25, and 26, thereabouts, depending on my memory, that Paul actually went to Spain. If you have the privilege of going to London, not now during coronavirus uh, time, but when things are normal, uh, you can cross a place where it said Julius Caesar crossed the River Thames. It's uh, uh, what it, the Chelsea Bridge, which joins one part of London to another. Right there at the Chelsea Bridge, on the northern side of the bridge, they said that was the actual landing of Julius Caesar. It didn't stay that long because the weather sucks and London teams can't come close to Liverpool. And so uh, Paul, uh, Julius then assigned Hadrian, uh, General Hadrian, to, to the jurisdiction of Britannia, and he built a wall because the Scots are crazy. And so you can go there and you'll see Hadrian's wall. And the Apostle Paul went as far as Britannia preaching the gospel. And so his measure, according to verse 2 Corinthians chapter number 10, he says, the measure that God has given me has reached even unto you. The measure has reached even unto you. Dr. Chong, 
Dr. Paul Yonggi Cho was asked a question some years ago in the uh, early 80s why he doesn't travel to certain countries. And he was very emphatic. He said, I don't have an anointing to go to those countries. God has given me South Korea. And he says, my prayer is that God would anoint me in my lifetime to see North and South join together. He said, so my prayer, even though I'm praying to reach other people and reach other nations, he said, God has called me for the Korean Peninsula. And part of the, the interview that was taken, and again, I'm just giving you a summation of what was said, not the verbatim interview. Uh, he shares that he didn't want to preach in Japan because he didn't like Japanese people because of what the Japanese did uh, in terms of persecuting the Korean people. And when the Japanese believers who had enjoyed uh, the texture and quality of anointing from that church, the Full Gospel Church, Yoda Church in Korea, they requested that Dr. Cho come and start an extension of his ministry in Japan. And he said he didn't want to go. And so, because women aren't given a, a platform in equal status, at least weren't given an equal platform in equal status with men, he said he sent two women because he didn't want Japanese people to be saved. And uh, he sent two women there. And uh, they had struggled to grow. And eventually the Holy Spirit convicted him. So he went to Japan. He preached a couple of nights. And like the third or fourth night, he said, while he was sitting on his bed, he was feeling a little queasy, like he, he, he was having an upset stomach. And suddenly right in front of him, the demonic prince over Japan and that area appeared and said to him, in essence, I've been the prince of this area for 4,000 years. Don't you think that you are going to come here and destroy what I've built and established? And he said, inside of him, it's like a furnace exploded, like a Bunsen burner inside of him turned into a furnace. And the Holy Spirit to him, the devil is a liar. Confess the scripture. And so he began to confess the scripture. Resist the devil, he will free from you. And the Spirit said, oh, I also know my Bible. I also know the Bible. And the Holy Spirit said the devil is a lie. He's afraid of the scripture. And Dr. Cho began to rebuke that spirit using scriptures. You know, uh, I have power over demonic spirits. Mark chapter number 16. And uh, Satan shortly will be under your feet. Romans chapter number 11. And so the spirit said to him, oh, I see you quote scripture. I'll leave you now, but I'll be back. And so what they tried to achieve in many, many, many years, over a decade... In that first service, after that event with that demonic prince, the Holy Spirit fell, and over 1,500 Japanese people spoke with tongues as they were baptized in the Holy Spirit. It took an apostolic rank to break something that had been established there for over 4,000 years. Stay with me. And so in my own personal journey, my own personal journey, there are many things I have learned without having a point of reference with any person and beginning to search the scriptures to find if what I was doing personally could be backed by scriptures. Uh, when we started around about the late 80s, early 90s, Cheech and I began to support a number of pastors. We had a worker that was working for the church. His name was Ali. And I can't remember his surname. And so uh, there's a place just other side, Headlands, on the way to Mutare, before Rusapi. Just other side, the railway line there, there's a place, there was a farm called Waterloo Farm. And so we went to Waterloo Farm and started a church there, and then we started supporting pastors. And in that journey, I remember uh, a man joined us. Uh, I'd love to see him if anybody has his contact, by the name of Kingston Mawere. He's part of a great dynasty of families, the oldest... Uh, uh, was uh, Kenneth Mawere, and then the youngest was John Mawere, and Kenneth was somewhere in the middle. And I'd known Kenneth uh, for uh, at least um, Kingston for a number of years, because when we came to Arari in 1974, my dad and uh, the missionaries had a, a special service in a part of Zevere Sequa called Gillingham. And so he was one of the pastors that uh, was reached and I remember going to preach for him when I moved to Harare. 
he had a bit of an american accent and then he disappeared not because of his american accent uh we just couldn't find him and we learned that he went to the united states when he came back from the united states after about 20 years uh he sought me out and i was now leading a new life chapel on samora michel and our church had grown significantly one day he said to me i want to introduce you to a family and so he then introduced me to the cassesi family is still here this morning still are you here and is still are any of the cassesis here somewhere there we go all right and so we then went and met the cassesis and i remember going into their yard 15 series avenue in uh, Hat- hatfield when i got to the gate i could hear screaming and wailing and i was like what in the what in the world is going on and uh, walking towards the house they were screaming and wailing it wasn't uh, a a scream like somebody was being beaten or abused it was an intercessory prayer scream it's a language that intercessors understand and i thought well this is amazing but there was a man on our right that had a big stick and he looked like he was hitting uh, uh, you know uh, slashing grass and i thought to myself but that's a weird way to slash grass using a stick you know can't the guy use a slasher and then the law spoke to me and said you will support that man and uh, i i said i will because we're already supporting pastors when we got into the house micah says he said uh, moses is here moses is here so i thought maybe kingston's surname or other name was moses and so she said to me you are moses and i was like what has kingston brought me to and then she began to say you are going to preach in stadiums you are going to preach in very large platforms you will preach to a million people you'll have churches around the world zaka so wonder everywhere and so i left the place a little bit confused and trepid and thought you know the bible says uh, the disciple said one to another we have seen strange things today <laughs> and uh, i was like but my heart was burning within me and so as we walked our journey with the cassesses we began to see some things unfold one of them was we started a revival in epworth and uh, the way that revival began the man that was using that stick to slash that was a uh, past impofu and uh, he became one of our travelers in starting churches and so we were sitting in my office he came one i think it was a, a thursday and he said to me bishop i had a dream last night uh that i went to epworth and there was a very very big snake by a water place and the snake had three horns on it and he said when i went to break the horns on that snake the holy spirit said it's not for you it's for bishop bismarck and the horn in the middle is for uh, archbishop ezekiel guti so i said well let's go so we jumped in the car and we went to epworth and we were looking for this water hole i forgot about the quarry that was there that was full of water and so i left him at about uh, half past 12 i left him there i raced into town to pick up cheech for lunch he used to work at scanlan and holness took her for lunch and then took her back and about quarter past 20 past 2 he was waiting for me at the first main curve coming into epworth on the left are those rocks that the tourist site apparently some of those uh, rocks appear on our money uh which has moved dramatically the rocks are still there the money is not <laughs> give me a break and so around that curve he was waiting for me there and when i got there he said to me bishop you know what happened as soon as you had left there was a man pushing his mother in law in a wheelbarrow and her leg was swollen and there was pus and blood coming out and the holy spirit said for me to pray for her. he said and i prayed for her because the uh, the son in law mkwasha was taking her to a traditional healer to get medicine and he said when i prayed for her the bleeding stopped and the lord said your bishop is coming and he'll pray for her and you'll see a miracle so when i got into the little area there were a number of people gathered there and i prayed for this lady and the swelling in her leg instantly went down right before our eyes and so the people began to rejoice and so pastor dakwa shadrick dakwa began services there that moment we went for service that night thursday friday by the weekend there were 76 people we baptized in that service was a young man by the name of noah pahua and he took the 
uh, message to his family in Marondera. Now, when you get to Marondera, you go about 60 kilometers in towards the Chihota area. His family had a farm and land there. And so we went there. Now, as we were going into that place, we were crossing from one farm into the next. And my car broke down, started jerking. And so I said to Bishop Gassesi, who was with me, I said, I think we have just come into a territory of a demonic prince that is hostile. And Bishop Gassesi named the spirit. And uh, when we got to the place where we were praying for the Pahua family, we could hear people screaming. There were witches there and so on. But out of the ground, Bazalwani, out of the ground, yellow sulfuric smoke was coming out of the ground. And the Lord said, the spirits of this area have been judged by the apostles that have come here. There were four of us that day. It was Dakwa Jr., Jakwa Sr., Kasesi, and myself. And literally the ground was shaking. Started a major ministry there. Noah Poa then introduced us to his family that were in the Mtoku area by Chimkopa, other side, other side Nyamzue School. And we started some significant ministry there. That all began not because of my desire to evangelize, even though we were evangelizing, it was the apostolic rank that God had placed on our lives. And we've seen so many things happen. Uh, this ministry, Jabula, was huge in Zimbabwe. And there were certain individuals that, with many actions, destroyed our ministry, and we're trying now to build it up again. But I'll tell you what, when you have strong apostolic ministry from, from uh, a place... That ministry has a measure of rule to reach even unto certain places. And throughout my years, God has given me an anointing, not so much for Europe, a lot in the UK, uh, the United States, not so much in South America. South America seems to be opening just a little, and uh, I'm not so sure if I want to go into some of those areas. But one place where I saw apostolic ministry function the best was in Cayman Islands where just apostolic grace, apostolic ministry came in there and began to rebuke and judge the spirits on that island. Now, as I close, the apostle says uh, that our measure is stretched to reach even unto you. And he goes on to say that we, we, we labor in this measure. So every person in this room, you have a measure of rule in some area. For some, it's music. For others, it's business. For some, it's uh, 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 some uh, profound profession you have, whether medical, law, whatever it is, you have an actual measure. Not everybody has the same kind of gift. Uh, it just seems to me like they need better people on VAR because things go wrong when we should be winning. They need to put somebody with a greater measure of rule to rule. So the apostle concludes this writing to uh, his disciples in Corinth. He says, when your faith is increased, everyone say increased faith. Shout increased faith. When your faith is increased, we shall be enlarged. When your faith is increased. Paul is saying to them, my measure on my life has reached even unto you. The measure in my life has brought you teaching on the gift of the Holy Spirit. The measure in my life has brought you teachings on uh, eschatology, 1 Corinthians 15. Paul writes about the second coming of Jesus. He talks about rank and measure. And he says, but the reason for that is because your faith has increased. And as your faith increases, we shall be enlarged. So for you, your faith must increase. So when your faith increases, for example... Who doesn't own a home? Who doesn't own your own house? You don't own a house. Stand up if you don't own a house. Quickly, 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 stand up. You don't own a house. You're renting. Now, for you that don't own a house, how many of you here want to own your own house? Raise your hand. Now, your faith must increase. In other words, every day you have to begin to confess, I own a house. I own a house. See yourself living in that house. The bigger, the better. Now, when your faith increases in that area, the apostolic gift here is enlarged because then we can come in 
with apostolic grace and deal with what your faith is believing for. So Jesus is the apostle of us all. Hebrews chapter number three, verse one, throw it up. Jesus is the bishop. He's the apostle of our faith. Hebrews chapter number three. Holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our confession, Jesus Christ. So Jesus is our apostle. So Jesus as apostle is walking on a certain road in chapter number nine of the book of Matthew. And as he's walking there, a woman who's been sick for 12 years with an issue of blood had faith in her life that if she touches the hem of his garment, she will be made whole. So her faith increased. Now up until this point, if you read all the miracles that Jesus performed, put Matthew chapter number 9, verse 37. Matthew 9, verse 37. Matthew 9, 37. Then say the disciples, go to the verse above that. Verse 35 and 35, 35, 35. Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in the synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, preaching the gospel of the king, healing every sickness and every disease among the people. So he's performing miracles on a scale where he's healing all the sick. But none of those that are mentioned in there is in the category of somebody that had an issue of blood. So there is a woman that has an issue of blood. She's been bleeding from inside out for 12 years. And she said within herself, if I may touch the hem of his garment, I will be made whole. We come to Paul's teaching that when your faith is increased, even Jesus then became enlarged. For all the miracles he had performed, he had never performed a miracle of someone touching him and the issue of blood drying up. So for you now, if you, if you don't have a house and you really want a house, I want you to shout at the top of your, your voice, I own my own house. One more time. So now your faith is enlarged. Your faith is increased. So the question is, where do you want to own your own house? So name the suburb. Name the size of the house. Now when your faith is increased, apostolic grace now can come in with its measure of rule and extend even to you. So we declare from this pulpit to you that I in need, my God shall supply. All of your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. I need about a hundred people to clap your hands. If you don't have a car, shout three times, I have my own car. I have my own car. I have my own car. If you don't have a job, shout three times, I have a great job. It's paying me well. Give your neighbor an elbow. Say, increase your faith. And the gift will be enlarged. So I'm asking God, increase my measure to manage my finance. Money's coming to me now. I'm saying to God, increase my measure to finance the gospel. So my measure has increased. I'm saying to God, increase my measure so my businesses can be promoted. I'm saying to God, increase my measure so my word is credible in the banks around the world. I'm saying to God, increase my measure so I can build churches, schools and hospitals. I'm saying to God, increase my measure to establish universities. I'm saying to God, increase my measure so I can have an evangelism drive. I'm saying to God, increase my measure so we can elevate the living conditions of people in this nation. But it all happens when God has his hand on your life. I pray that God will give you a Damascus Road experience. Paul, I need you because I need a church in Corinth. But it all starts on the Damascus Road. In the next 10 days, many of you in this room, you're going to have a Damascus Road experience. And you'll ask the Lord, who are you? 
and the Lord will respond I am Jesus I am your provider I am your way maker I am your blesser increase my measure shall increase my measure shall increase my measure increase my measure increase my measure come on with passion I need you to push with passion shall increase my measure even though COVID-19 seems to have closed the doors God is increasing your measure press down shake it together and run it over I want you to clap your hands and celebrate the measure of rule in your life give him a praise praise him again praise him hard you're going to experience an increase in your life you're going to experience an enlargement in your life you're going to experience a breakthrough in your life you're going to experience an increased anointing in your life. You're going to experience your hand enlarged, your steps enlarged, your mind enlarged, your eyes opening wide, your ears hearing things that no man can hear. I command it in your life. I'm calling on God that between now and November 1, you'll have a Damascus Road experience say yes say yes say Lord take the scales off of my eyes Ananias I'm your Ananias today scales must fall off your eyes you'll see the house you'll see the blessing you'll see the miracles but the scales have to come off your eyes when the scales come off your eyes You'll go to Cilicia, you'll be in Pamphylia, you'll reach Corinth and Laodicea, you'll go to Sardis and Thyatira, put your hands off your, on your eyes, say scales, fall off my eyes, scales, fall off my eyes. Come on Zimbabweans, believe God, believe God, believe God, your measure is increasing. Lord, I believe, I believe, now that the scales are falling off my eyes, I can see, I can hear, I can walk, I can talk, I believe. Clap your hands, all ye people. God has a great work for you. But before you can do that work, he's got to increase your measure. Shout increase, increase my measure. Shout increase my measure. Give God a praise if you can. I said a yes, Lord. I said yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. I feel an anointing, increasing measure, anointing increasing measure come on pray in the holy ghost ragabataka increase my measure 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 i said a yes lord Woo! hallelujah praise him for the good things he has done Praise Him for the doors He has opened. Praise Him for the way He has made. Clap your hands, everybody. Can you feel that anointing? I said, can you feel that anointing? It's coming to sit on your head. It's coming to sit on your life. It's going to be in your house when you get there. Woo! Pray after me. Say, Heavenly Father, I thank you for the gifts you have given me. 
Heavenly Father, I thank you for what you have done for me. I couldn't be where I am without you. But I thank you for great things you are about to do in my life where I hasn't seen and ear hasn't heard what you are about to do for me. So I thank you in advance. I praise you in advance for increasing my measure, for increasing my influence, for increasing my anointing, for enlarging my territory. I am anointed by the power of the Holy Spirit that's on my life. Shout, I am enlarged. My measure has increased in the name of Jesus. Now take 30 seconds and pray in the Holy Ghost. Rakabataka, Rakatala Moshamba, Rambandalaba Sindi, Umbrandalaba Shatala Kutala. Struggling a little bit this morning because my mouth is sore. I had to see uh, a dentist on Friday and he pulled out my tooth. So this is a bit sore. And uh, he said, I can save it. He said, but it would, be, it would be more prudent for me to pull it. And so I went home after that. I went home to lie down. And before I dozed off to sleep, I got a word of knowledge. I got a word of knowledge. And the Lord said, the pulling of this tooth is metaphoric. He said, because this tooth... Uh, because I started chewing on this side of my mouth. I wasn't chewing this side. He said, this tooth has been an impediment for you to process strong meat. Now that it's removed, you'll be able to process strong meat. I'm ready for strong meat. I said, I'm ready for strong meat. I, I'm ready for strong meat. Put Hebrews chapter number five as I close. Hebrews chapter number 5, go to about verse 10. Hebrews chapter 5, around about verse 10. 11. Of whom many things are yet to be said and hard to be uttered, seeing you are dull of hearing. Say, I'm not dull of hearing. Say, I'm not dull of hearing. Next verse, 12. When you ought to be teachers, you need to be taught again. The first principle of God is God. And you become those that have need of milk and not strong meat. I want you to pray this prayer. Say, Heavenly Father, give me strong meat. Say, Heavenly Father, give me strong meat. Acts chapter 10, Peter goes into the housetop because they were preparing a meal of strong meat. And then the lords of ordinary meat by the hands of Jews. And then a sheet comes out of heaven and lands where he's sleeping. And the Lord says to Peter, the Bible says all manner of, of creature were in the sheet. And the Lord said to Peter, kill and eat. In other words, I'm changing you from one area of people preparing food. I'm now releasing into your life strong meat. Who's ready for strong meat? I said, who's ready for strong meat? Amen. Find that scripture, Acts chapter number 10, round about verse 15, 16. Find it for me. Find it for me. Find it for me quickly. Say, I'm ready for strong meat. Elbow somebody, say, are you ready for strong meat? Acts 10. Acts 10. Acts 10. Help me, guys, help me. I don't want to lose this moment. I don't want to lose this moment. Just go to Acts 10, verse 15. Just go there. We'll navigate from there. Go to the verse above that. Go to verse 14, 13. There came a voice. Go to verse 12. Wherein were all manner of four-footed beasts, four-footed beasts in the earth, and wild beasts, and creeping things, and fowls of the air. Those are different messages, each of those. Verse number 13. And there came a voice to him that said, Arise, say, Arise, Arise. Kill, kill, 
and say arise kill and eat say arise kill and eat you are about to experience that you are going to see things that you are not accustomed to seeing even in the business world but God is going to say arise kill and eat look at Peter's response Peter's response Peter said not so Lord I have never eaten anything that is uncommon or unclean God is about to take you to a place of uncommon blessing Father I pray for increased measure you have your tithe your offering in your hands let's give Thank you, Lord, for arising, killing, and eating. Thank you for strong meat. Strong, strong, strong meat. Strong meat. Shandara kumba talaraba. Yaraba sande, you are increasing my measure. Kunra takalaba usenderete. You are increasing my measure. of praise with a decent song give thank you for your support, thank you for giving amen, we are about to build this building father thank you for strong meat finance thank you for strong meat investments thank you for strong meat businesses thank you for strong meat relationships thank you for strong meat breakthroughs don't lose the anointing in here, don't leave it in the parking lot don't cast it before swine. And all are watching from around the world and New Life Covenant Church members throughout the city, thank you for being with us today. Remember that God is increasing your measure of rule. I want you to lift up your head. I want you to walk in it. I want increase in your life. Thank you for being with us on this Sunday morning. May the Lord enrich you. May he go with you. From Chichi and I, we love you. God bless you. Amen.